Good afternoon, Professor Lowe. Good afternoon, Sir Brown. Well, that means you can both hear me and see me, so, uh, Miss Richards. Uh, um, I'm sorry, could, could I just make two quick comments arising from yesterday's session? Yes. Uh, right. Uh, firstly, uh, you asked me about freeze-dried cryoprecipitate and the reason that Scottish National Blood Transfusion did not progress its uh, development. And I found last night the minutes of a meeting on the 21st of January 1983, uh, which was a meeting of SNBTS and Scottish uh, Haemophilia Centre. Can, can, you, can you tell me, were you actually at the meeting yourself? No, no, I wasn't, but it does answer the question that you asked. And, right. Uh, we do so have the, the minutes. Uh, well, we, we, we've got the minute, I think. So, a minute, right. So can, um, what, was, what was the next point? Okay, so it includes Drs. Prentice, Forbes and MacDonald who co-authored the paper on the trial and Dr. Cash, as you can see, thanked them for this and said that SNBTS decided to abandon the project for three reasons. Closure of the West of Scotland uh, blood transfusion service freeze-drying plant at Law Hospital. Secondly, cost of the meeting standards demanded by the Medicines Inspectorate. And then, as I mentioned yesterday, the most important was the prospective availability of a hepatitis risk reduced factor eight concentrate. And that, of course, was very timely for the appearance of HIV in December 1984, so that they could proceed to immediately replace the old product. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, second question, um, Ms. Richard just a very pertinent question about what patients were told about non-A, non-B hepatitis following the September 1980 uh, symposium on unsolved clinical problems. And I recall that in within a few months, Drs. Forbes and Dr. Sturrock, the rheumatologist, presented at, at the monthly department unit research meeting their planned study, which addressed two of the unsolved clinical problems, liver disease, including the unique opportunities for research, which the symposium highlighted, and arthritis. And they were starting a five-year study of arthritis and liver disease at the Haemophilia Review Clinic. And you may want to come back to that when you ask about research. Thank you, Professor. Um, can I um, uh, just pick up one document you referenced yesterday, which we didn't have available to display, but do now, just to check we're talking about the same document. Uh, it's PRSE 304632, please show Mick. You referred to attending a 1975 symposium, Professor. Is this the symposium you were referring to? That is it, yes. And we can see uh, for the four o'clock session, you referred to Dr. Krask, um, and his presentation is entitled Virus Hepatitis Complicating Replacement Therapy. We can see the date of this symposium is the 19th of September, 1975. Would it be right to um, infer that uh, his address, given what you said yesterday about your memory of it, included reference to the outbreak of non-A, non-B hepatitis in Bournemouth that he published about in The Lancet in August of that year. I, I think that was the focus of the, of the talk, yes. Thank you. We can take that down, show me. Pro Professor Lowe, I'm going to m move on to ask you about uh, HIV. Um, I I'll mostly be asking you about the process of HIV testing and informing patients of their diagnosis, but, but just before we come on to that, Professor Forbes told the Penrose Inquiry that he'd had some early contact with Dr. Oscar Ratnoff in the States about an, an early case of, of this, this disease in, in, in a haemophiliac, possibly in, in late 1981. The, 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 the evidence isn't entirely clear. D did, did you have any knowledge at the time of any contact between Professor Forbes and Dr. Ratnoff? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, you do say, however, in your witness statement to this inquiry that you think you became aware of AIDS cases in haemophiliacs in late 1982 through being told about it by Professor Forbes, who was initiating a study of immune abnormalities in patients with severe haemophilia. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think Dr. Forbes, again, at one of these monthly uh, research meetings, uh, was presenting the early um, D 
data and saying that from that point he wanted to set up immunological studies. But I think I also, in my own reading, read about it, I think perhaps in, in The Lancet, which I subscribe to. Um, I'll come back at a later stage to ask you about that particular study in relation to immune abnormalities. Uh, do I also correctly understand from your witness statement that as you had little, if any, interaction with haemophilia patients in that crucial period for, for HTLV3 purposes, 82 to 84, you had no involvement in providing or communicating information to patients about the risks of, of AIDS. That's absolutely correct, and I think I, I've told you what I did year by year, and at the start of 1983, um, I had a talk with Professor Kennedy, my head of department, and he said, you really must uh, take time off and get your MD thesis written up. So he gave me, I think, about six months off the ward completely, and then he also told me that I had um, done enough um, hemophilia and any other thing on his unit, and I was to be rotated to Professor Lawson's unit to expand my experience in uh, other areas like uh, diabetes and other aspects of vascular diseases. So I had very little contact with the haemophilia unit. And so does this also follow? It sounds like it probably does, but you wouldn't, you didn't know, wouldn't know from your own knowledge, as opposed to anything you might have read or thought about later, um, about whether any changes were made to the centre's treatment policies at that time. Um, the only thing I can think of was, um, uh, when you say at that time, do you mean 1983? 82, 83, 84. Um, well, I think two things happened in 1983. First, as, as you know, um, Scotland became almost, well, pretty well self-sufficient in fact rate concentrate. So there was, uh, I don't think commercial fact rate concentrate was used much, and we looked at that um, data yesterday. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, was, that, was there also an early UK HCDO uh, suggestion about um, reverting to cryoprecipitate for um, um, patients who received little treatment? There was a communication in the middle of 1983 from UK HCDO, but we, we, we've looked at that on multiple occasions. It's really whether you, from your own knowledge at the time, are able to add to that at all. No, I can't add to that. So I want to move then to the question of testing for um, HTLV3, in which um, uh, I think you um, you had some involvement, even if potentially at a, at a relatively late stage. I want to look just first at what Professor Forbes um, told the Penrose Inquiry in one of his written statements on this issue to see whether you can help us understand the position more widely. Uh, show me it's PRSC four, sorry, PRSC three zeros four two five nine. This is one of Professor Forbes' written statements um, to the Penrose Inquiry, and if we go to the second page, no, sorry, the third page, please, show me. and we look at the top two paragraphs, 4 and 4.1, you'll see a question about um, whether there was a, an early testing of blood samples by Dr. Melby, or Melby in his laboratory in Denmark, and then subsequent testing by Dr. Follett. And Professor Forbes' answer was, I do not remember in detail when the samples were taken, but they must have been for some months prior to the testing date, which was 1984. And these initial samples were all tested by Dr. Melby in Denmark. Subsequent to that, Dr. Follett at Rockhill was given samples for local testing, and that took place for many months thereafter. Now, I'm going to come on to Dr. Follett in a moment, in a few minutes. Um, uh, do you have any knowledge of whether samples were tested by Dr. Melby in Denmark of Glasgow patients? Um, <clears throat> I would have to check, but I think that's a mistake from Dr. Forbes's memory, which, which, as you understand, was getting a bit poor at the time of the Penrose inquiry. And I think if you look at uh, the statement of Dr. Karen Froebel, who was his uh, colleague, um, I think her... That's the next document I was going to go to, Professor. Oh, I, so. I, I beg your pardon. No, no, that's quite and right. I, I, think, I, think, I think 
uh, she corrected Professor Florida's statement and said that he was in touch with Dr. Melby because she'd read, I think, his paper in The Lancet or somewhere, um, and they had a discussion and they agreed to combine the samples from Denmark and from Glasgow and send to Dr. Gallo's laboratory and do a joint study to look at in, in the whole of the European samples if, if they were um, related to American commercial concentrate. Let, let's just look at, do, at Dr. Um, um, is it Freebel's the pronunciation? Uh, Fro Frobel, Frobel, Frobel statement. PRSE 302026, please show Mick. So we can see that this is a statement to the Penrose Inquiry from Dr. Karen Frobel, June 2011. She talks about working in the Department of Medicine Research Laboratory at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Um, if we just move to the second page, please. And if we look at the third paragraph down, beginning, things were moving very quickly. If we just zoom in on that paragraph, please, show Mick. Um, so she refers to, to Montagne and Gallo, we'll leave aside the precise dates, and, and then says this, we were interested to know as soon as possible whether the Glasgow haemophiliac patients had antibody to the virus. In Glasgow, there was a freezer full of stored serum samples from an earlier study, which Dr. Forbes suggested could be used. I wrote to both Montagne and Gallo and had a reply from Dr. Gallo directing me to send the samples to his research scientist. The samples, 77, were located, I think, by Dr. Maddock, packed in dry ice, and Dr. Forbes and I took them to Glasgow Airport to be air freighted to the laboratory in the US. At this point, I still thought the results would be negative, that we were dealing with something different in Scotland, and I can still recall the shock when the news came back that 12 of our 77 samples, i.e. 16%, tested positive. Very soon after that, Mads Melby appeared and suggested writing a joint paper pooling our results with his 22 Danish samples, and this resulted in the Lancet paper in December 84. We'll look at the Lancet paper in a moment, Professor Lowe, uh, um, not least because it has your name as one of the, the contributors. Um, but it is, is what is described here by Dr. Froebel, the, the sending off of 77 store, frozen stored serum samples to Dr. Gallo in the States, your understanding of what happened? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't involved. Um, I wasn't working on the unit at the moment. Um, I think the first I knew about this and I think I said this at the Penrose inquiry, uh, was I first heard about this study uh, from Dr. Forbes and Dr. Froebel maybe about um, late September, early October, because they had asked Dr. Melby to, to come to Glasgow uh, and help draft this joint paper that's referred to there. And I attended that meeting because Dr. Forbes had asked if I could write as part of that, it, it was a bit separate, um, uh, a brief account of uh, a patient from England that Dr. Forbes had, who'd come back to Glasgow, uh, and well, you'll see it in the paper. I wrote that description of this paper uh, about a patient who'd, um, who'd developed AIDS. Okay, well, let's um, go then to the Lancet article, which is PRSC 0001630, uh, please show me. So if we zoom in on the top half of the page to start with, just so that we can read it more clearly. Thank you. So we can see it's the Lancet, late December of 1984. HTLB3 seropositivity in European haemophiliacs exposed to factor eight concentrate imported from the USA. And then we can see a number of, of contributors, including Dr. Karen Froebel, Professor Forbes, yourself, Dr. Gallo, Dr. Maddock, Dr. Melby from Denmark. Um, and then if we just pick up the first few lines in the summary, we can see that 77 Scottish haemophiliacs and 22 Danish haemophiliacs were serologically tested for antibodies to human T-cell leukemia virus 3, HTLV3. And then there's a description of the, the treatment which Scottish patients, it was said, had, had largely received uh, and the treatment which the Danish patients had largely received. If we go down to the bottom half of the page, please show Mick, Under the, and zoom in on the heading introduction to the rest of, the, so we can see the rest of the page. Thank you. 
So the introduction, haemophiliacs are at increased risk of AIDS, uh, and then it refers to um, it being 1% of all diagnosed cases in the US and so on. Um, picking it up towards the end of that paragraph, we've compared HTLV3 antibody prevalences in two populations of haemophiliacs, Scottish patients who mainly use, sorry, we've lost it, show me, who mainly use factor eight concentrate of local origin and Danish patients who use both imported and locally manufactured concentrates. And then in terms of materials and methods, describes the taking of blood from Danish haemophiliacs during routine health evaluation in April of 84. Detailed information was available on the, if you can go over the page, top of the next page, left-hand column, um, on the amount and origin of factor eight or nine used by each patient. And then it says this about the Glasgow patient, similar data were obtained on Scottish haemophiliacs enrolled in the regional haemophilia reference centre, Glasgow, Blood was taken from these patients between December 1983 and July 1984. Uh, and then we see a description of the tests being, being done. Um, we'll just complete looking at this and then I'm going to ask you some questions. We can then see under the next heading, results patient with AIDS. If we can go into that paragraph, please. Show me. A 35-year-old Scottish haemophilia A patient with no other AIDS risk factors since 1979 been treated exclusively with US manufactured factor eight concentrate in high dosage. In the last seven months, he had malaise, anorexia, weight loss, intermittent fever, lymphadenopathy, and night sweats. There were persistent hepatic lesions of the lips and oral cavity, and also candidiasis of the mouth and anus. Latterly, he complained of dysphagia and central sternal pain. He was HTLB3 seropositive, lymph lymphopenic, and moderately thrombocytopenic, and had reduced responses to several mitogens. T helper cell numbers were reduced, as was the helper suppressor ratio. In September 1984, he was admitted to hospital with streptococcal septicemia, and he died in late October with PCP. Just pausing there, Professor, as I understand it from your evidence, you wrote that part of the article. Uh, that's correct. Um, uh, was this a patient who had been treated with concentrates at the Glasgow Haemophilia Center? Uh, no. <clears throat> this was a, a patient from Glasgow who, I think, um, for several years, well, several years before this, moved down to a haemophilia center in England and attended there and, and had large quantities. Uh, well, uh, well, you've got the dates there. Uh, so he must have left Glasgow in the 1970s. Uh, I'd never seen the patient. Um, and uh, at the uh, centre in England, he received uh, US manufactured concentrate and high doses. And um, Dr. Forbes admitted him to Glasgow Bell Infirmary um, maybe about May and July because they're, they're talking about some T helper cells um, round, about, round about that time. Uh, Dr. F uh, basically, his parents brought him up to the center they were concerned about his health as you can see and dr forbes said oh i think we need to admit you for a few days for investigation so he was admitted to one of the investigation wards in glasgow Royal infirmary and dr forbes assembled the colleagues in um, immunology and infectious diseases and they concluded that he may not have had the strict definition of aids that uh, professor ludlam was talking about last week but it was perhaps more the kind of AIDS-related complex, the, the pre-AIDS kind of syndrome. So that diagnosis was, was made, and Dr. Forbes informed the patient and his uh, parents that that was, uh, that was the case. But uh, the patient was very keen to go back to the center in England. So Dr. Forbes uh, rang and um, uh, communicated with the director of the English center and explained what was happening. Um, and the patient went down but became more ill and decided he wanted to come home and be looked after by his uh, uh, parents. And um, shortly after that, um, he, had, um, uh, he had his fatal, uh, fatal septicemia. And I think the HTLV3 seropositivity wasn't done in Glasgow because Dr. Forbes didn't have the, the test. I think that was done at the English Centre. 
we, we've seen reference in previously to, to a case in Cardiff, a case in Bristol, um, and a case in Newcastle. Is this the same as the Newcastle case or a different case, do you know? Uh, am I allowed to tell you that? In relation to Newcastle, it's published in the media that somebody, um, um, a patient died in Newcastle. So provided you don't give any more detailed information than that, then, then yes. Uh, I, I think if that was published in the newspapers, it probably is, but I can't remember the newspaper. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> uh, can we then go, um, show me to the right-hand column of this article, at the same page, and zoom in on the bottom mm -hmm. half of the page. So we can see there the results in relation to Scotland. In Scotland, 11, 18% of 62 haemophilia A patients and 1, 7% of 15 haemophilia B patients were HTLV3 positive. All but two of the seropositive subjects were known to have received commercial factor concentrate in the period 79 to 84. One had travelled yearly throughout Europe and could have received unrecorded treatment. The other was a citizen of Pakistan who often visited his home country. Seropositive haemophilia patients had received more commercial clotting factor concentrate than seronegative subjects, whereas there was no statistical difference between the two groups in use of local products. Um, and then there follows a discussion, which I, I don't think I need to trouble you with. Um, it would uh, appear from this article that the tests that were undertaken on the 77 Scottish patients, Glasgow patients, were tests on blood taken from the patients between December 1983 and July 1984, which had presumably then been stored. Is that your understanding? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't directly involved in the study, but I think this, uh, these samples were taken by Dr. Maddock at the Haemophilia Centre because he and Dr. Frobel uh, and Dr. Forbes uh, were performing this study of uh, immunological tests, that's the T-cell uh, subset stuff, that they had published, I think, the year before, in 1983. So at that time, they were um, doing uh, studies um, of such patients. And then I think um, the other potential source, because I have to say I don't know directly, I wasn't involved in the study, was in fact the, the study I was mentioning right at the start of this session, um, the study that Dr. Forbes and Dr. Sturrock um, uh, set up um, with, with um, uh, uh, to look at um, in, in a larger population than the patients who had the immunological studies, um, this five-year study of arthritis, arthritis and of uh, liver disease. And as part of that study, um, samples were stored in the rheumatology department of the Department of Medicine. Um, and those, I recall, were used for immunological tests that they thought might be related to uh, liver disease uh, and or to arthritis. So those were studies done in the University Department of Medicine's rheumatology laboratory, things like rheumatoid factor complements, immune complexes, that, that kind of uh, um, that kind of thing. So is this and right, that, that, that it, um, the, st the samples, the 77 patient samples that were sent to Dr. Gallo in the States to be tested using his tests for HTLV3 were taken from stored samples which the, were held at the Royal Infirmary which had been obtained for the purposes of research, you think, whether it was this, whether it was the um, um, the Froebel um, Maddock research or another piece of research held for research, and they were sent for HTLV3 testing. That that's correct, is it? Well, I, I can't confirm that. I'm just trying to think what samples would have been taken at the Haemophilia Centre and stored in the Department of Medicine, because reading Dr. Uh, Froebel's account, uh, it sounds as if those were the studies that the rheumatologists and Dr. Forbes uh, were, were studying in these other uh, studies, which basically was studies of arthritis and immune uh, abnormalities and liver disease. Um, 
in patients attending the Haemophilia Centre, but I wasn't involved in that. I'm just trying to think those are the only studies I could think of uh, in which um, samples from patients attending the Haemophilia Clinic would be stored in the Department of, uh, of Medicine. The only other possible source could have been, I suppose, um, the samples that were routinely sent to Dr. Follett at the Regional Virus Laboratory for hepatitis B testing, because that was routine as part of uh, um, screening of uh, patients with haemophilia for, for hepatitis uh, B. Um, and But the Regional Virus Laboratory was at this uh, separate hospital, Ruck Hill Hospital, uh, and they had stored samples as was routine for hepatitis B uh, B testing. So if the samples came from the Department of Medicine, my best guess, and it is only a guess because I wasn't involved, would be that that was the origin of the, of the samples. Did, did the Glasgow Haemophilia Centre, to your knowledge of, at, at this time or, or from when you became more closely involved in ni 1985 onwards, did it have what we've seen referred to in, by, by, at Edinburgh under the Royal Free Hospital as a longitudinal sera store? Um, not, not to my knowledge, no. Um, all the routine um, blood tests that were done in patients at the Haemophilia Centre, I recall, were um, you know, to the NHS Haematology Department for blood counts, factor eight levels, inhibitors, that kind of thing, uh, biochemistry uh, for liver function tests, um, and then the sample sent to the Regional Virus Laboratory for hepatitis B testing. I can't think of any other... Um, uh, studies. I was working on the thrombosis, as you know, for most of this time, and um, I was doing studies uh, with Dr. Forbes and Prentice on, on thrombosis patients, and some of those at their research studies would be studied in the coagulation um, part of the Department of Medicine, but the rheumatology uh, part was, was quite separate uh, from, from that, and I don't recall any haemophilia samples being stored by Dr. Forbes and Prentice in, in the blood coagulation okay. bit of the laboratory. The 77 patients whose samples were sent to, to, to the States for testing by Dr. Gallo were not told, were they, that this was being undertaken and that their um, blood was being tested for HTLV3? Well, <clears throat> I think Dr. Forbes was asked... Um, uh, was asked this question, um, and I can't quite remember what he <laughs> what he said, to be honest. Uh, I, I have no direct knowledge. Uh, I think Dr. Forbes at one point was asked at the Penrose inquiry, um, these tests that were sent to, to Gallo, were patients informed of this? And I think he said no. Would that be right? I, I, that is right. I don't want to mis misquote him. Um, and, and that's the case... Um, my best guess is that Dr. Forbes, um, uh, well, I think, I think the context at this time, as you know, was that the UK HCDO in general um, um, was suggesting that Dr. Tedder had, I think, uh, an HTLV test, an early one, uh, in London, and was happy if haemophilia centres in the UK wanted to send them samples, and that, that's been published, as you know, in two publications in The Lancet, I think. Um, and Dr. Forbes, uh, and, but I think, as far as I recall, um, Dr. Tedder didn't have um, much capacity uh, and said, you know, don't, don't send me too many. Uh, but if you want to send me a dozen or so, I, I think Dr. Ludlam and others have perhaps talked about uh, uh, this. And I think uh, Dr. Forbes and Dr. Frobel thought, uh, to answer the question about the relationship between commercial or European origin um, uh, plasma, um, uh, for, from which concentrates were prepared, you're going to need quite a big number of samples. So I think, I think their aim was to try and get uh, a reasonable number of studies. And that was, I think, what was suggested to Dr. Froebel by Dr. Melby and Dr. Gallo. And I think I, I understand uh, that that may have been the, uh, the, the arrangement. OK. If we could just go back to the first page of this, please. And you'll understand, Professor, in part I'm asking you these questions because this is a study which, which bears your name. Um, 
you were involved with, to some extent at least, the, uh, the, the letters that were then sent out in January 1985 to patients. I'm going to come on to that. But at the point in time at which this was published in December of 1984, the results of these tests, the, the 12 positive out of 77, had not been communicated to patients, had they? Um, when the paper was published? When the paper was published. I think that was what I was understanding. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to go to my evidence on this um, question. Um, could, sorry, could you remind me which section of my written statement um, that's looked at? I'll have to oh, just good. find it, Professor. You deal with the January letter from paragraph 41.1 onwards. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that number? You deal with the January letter from paragraph 41.1 onwards, and I'm going to come on to that. I just want to take this okay. in, in strict chronological um, order. It's just, I think... I've, I've referred to it under the research section, perhaps. I'm, I'm sorry, no, research 774112. Uh, my contribution as a co-author was critical review of the manuscript and then drafting first paragraph, um, not involved in anything else. Um, okay, uh, trying to think. Would it, perhaps it is back in that bit about the letter then. Yes, you say in, your, in the paragraph of your statement you've just referred to that you weren't directly involved in the study published in The Lancet, but your contribution as a co-author was critical review of the manuscript and then drafting the section that deals with the, the, the specific Scottish patient who developed AIDS. So you would have seen the manuscript at the time. And yes, indeed, indeed. Your, your letter is going to it. You then start to talk about the, the January letter from paragraph 41 onwards. But I, as I say, I want to come on to that in a minute. Uh, I, so could I just address the critical review bit? So uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, at some point I do talk about having a meeting in October with Dr. Forbes, Dr. Maddox, and Dr. Melby, at which I tabled uh, this account of the patient. And my other contribution, uh, the critical review, um, as with the previous paper that Dr. Froebel published on the immune studies, I think my contribution there was as somebody who knew uh, a bit about statistical analysis and how many numbers you needed of patients to get um, a significant results. In other words, the statistical power of the study. And that had been my critical review of the Froebel manuscript on T-cell subsets the year before. And I think they asked me to look at the statistics and check that their conclusions were correct on this one. I, I think that was my other contribution. Well, would you accept that in December of 1984, the issue of AIDS, and in particular the issue of AIDS in haemophiliacs, was a point in which, an issue in which there was a lot of press interest, was there not? We heard from Dr. Ludlam that that precipitated the meeting on the 19th of December, 84, in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Uh, yes, indeed. D did it not occur to you and your colleagues, whether you were when you were discussing this or in October or at any point in the, in the, the, the latter part of 1984, that a publication like this might get picked up in the mainstream media and that patients of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary could have learned about a cohort being HTLV3 positive from the press in circumstances where they had not yet themselves been told. Yes, indeed. And I'm sorry, I'm still trying to find where in my written evidence I address this issue because I do describe uh, this meeting in October with Dr. Melby. And my recollection is that after this meeting, um, there was a discussion, and it may be back in Dr. Froebel's evidence as well. Dr. Melby, I think Dr. Maddock drove Dr. Melby back to the airport, and Dr. Froebel and 
I sat with Dr. Forbes and said, well, um, before you publish a paper, do you want to think about um, the validity of, of the test? Because as a research study, which is looking at the association in a kind of public health issue, you know, if patients in Scotland are infected, which is which is a product? Is it the commercial or the Scottish or both or, or whatever? But Dr. Froebel, I think, pointed out, and I think it's in her statement, that the test that Dr. Gallo um, had was a research test, which had not been validated as a clinical diagnostic test um, in America or anywhere uh, else. Um, and that was a concern. And I think my memory of that was that Dr. Flowers was saying, well, uh, yes, absolutely right. And he was going to speak to Dr. Follett at the Regional Virus Laboratory to say, it, it's, this is going to be very difficult until you can um, get going with uh, a validated um, uh, clinical test that would be uh, um, suitable uh, to confirm the diagnosis. Because um, if you have research tests, which could well be false positives or false negatives, and I think you discussed that last week with uh, Professor Ludlam with respect to the tether tests, which I recall were in the same situation at the, at the time. Um, so the conversation around that time, I think, with Dr. Forbes was, I need to really get a clinically valid test as soon as possible. And the other thing he talked about is, I really need to get hold of a, a counselor who's going to help me in the counseling of uh, um, not just these patients, but all patients. Uh, when routine testing for HIV uh, comes about, so he was uh, thinking uh, very carefully about how to uh, uh, how how to handle the situation. It's paragraphs fifty point three, fifty point four, and fifty point five of your statement, um, Professor, in which you refer to um, the, the October meeting and discussions about the study and the finalisation of the paper, if that assists. Fifty point three. Fifty point three, fifty point four, and fifty point five. Um, professor, if the tests were not thought to be sufficiently reliable, wasn't the right course, rather than publishing the material in The Lancet, in terms which, if picked up by the media, could it have revealed to some of the patients that they tested positive? You'll recall the article includes reference to someone from Pakistan, it, it includes reference to someone who travelled in Europe frequently. Patients could have learnt from that article about their positivity in circumstances where no effort had yet been made to tell them by their clinicians. Does it not occur yes, to you that, that the right people sorry. to be told first are patients? Uh, sorry, uh, you're saying would the right thing to do to be the tell, to tell the patients first? Yes. I think, well, Dr. Forbes, I think, was in a very difficult situation. Um, he had, as I've said, he had reservations about whether the tests were accurately or not. Um, and he did want... Um, authoritative uh, tests and then I was asked at the Penrose inquiry as I say about subsequent events and the Edinburgh Centre uh, being uh, being discovered and the action taken to withdraw the unheated SNBTS concentrate um, etc and then um, 50.7 yeah so I think what Dr. Forbes had in mind when he drafted this letter of the 8th of January uh, was to uh, write to patients being very open about publishing the paper, um, talking about AIDS risk in uh, reproducing um, a, a form letter that had been drafted for all the haemophilus centres in Scotland, and then modifying it with regard to the Glasgow uh, situation. And I think the critical thing about this letter drafted on the 8th of January 
as he enclosed an appointment to see you to take a blood sample, um, perform skin tests, etc. And then the standard information given about AIDS risk. And my memory is that this letter was uh, drafted, given to myself and to the um, haemophilia sister, I think I said, with Ben Rose inquiry. And he said, this is what I've drafted. Can you have a look at it and let me have your uh, comments? And I want to take it to the first meeting of the UK HCDO uh, AIDS Working Party, which he'd set up and was chairing because they're meeting in, I think, a couple of days, uh, days time. So um, we had a very short time, Sister Campbell and I, to look at it and give them our comments. And we said, OK, we can, we can see what you're doing, but we understand that you're um, going to discuss this with the AIDS Advisory Group, and it, it does raise these uh, complicated issues. And he said, well, I've appointed Dr. Wilkie as a, as a counsellor, and she will be involved. And what we want to do is to uh, see these patients, in particular the ones who have tested positive, informed of the situation and then offer them what I suppose would be a mixture of uh, post-counselling about these research tests, stressing that they are not all that reliable. And what they want to do is to get their consent for a validated um, NHS test as and when Dr. Follett had, uh, had set it up. So that was my understanding of the, of the situation. Before we look at the 8th of January letter, which is um, sent out in, 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 in your name and Dr. Forbes' name, can I just go back to the question I asked about the December publication? Mm. As a matter of principle, would you accept that the proper course would be to tell patients, first of all, about their results, if necessary, undertaking a process of confirmatory testing before any information about the test results is placed in the public domain as it was through the December article? Uh, yes, I think, that, I think that is the case. And I think we're all a bit un, unhappy. I think Dr. Forbes was bouncing the need to publish the, um, um, the information in the public interest. It was thought at that time that this showed that um, it, it was largely the patients in Scotland who had the commercial concentrate to reflect uh, uh, who were <coughs> HIV positive. But that, of course, within a very short time, uh, was balanced by Dr. Ludlam's findings that, in fact, uh, um, most of his patients had received the, the NHS concentrate. I think things were moving very fast, and I think Dr. Forbes was quite conflicted as to uh, Publishing the information and his duties to the to the patient. Let, let's um, look at the January letter. PRSC four zero eight five nine. Please show me. So we can see this is the, dated the eighth of January nineteen eighty five. Um, if we just go to the third page briefly, please. We can see it's co-authored by you and by Dr. Forbes. If we go back to the first page, we can see um, it says, Dear uh, blank, presumably there for the patient's name to be inserted, as you may know, there's been recent publicity in the newspapers and television concerning an increased risk of the disease known as AIDS in haemophiliacs who've received treatment with clotting factor concentrates. Um, and then it talks in, in, in the next paragraph about uh, AIDS being uh, caused by a newly discovered virus. The risk of the disease AIDS and haemophiliacs appears to be very small and less than the risks of bleeding. We therefore recommend that you should continue treatment with clotting factor concentrates. Uh, several steps have been taken to reduce the risk of viruses in the clotting factor concentrates, and two steps are there set out. And then it says this, we do not yet have a blood test for the virus particle, but hope to have this within the next few months. However, we and other haemophilia centres do now have a blood test for antibody to the virus. If this antibody test is positive, this means that the person has been exposed at some time to virus particles. A positive test does not mean that the person will develop AIDS. 
Recent studies in England have found that about half of regularly treated haemophiliacs have positive antibody tests. We have recently tested stored blood samples from many of our patients of whom about 10% have positive antibody tests. The reason why fewer Scottish patients have positive tests compared to English patients is probably due to the fact that we've largely used Scottish concentrate in recent years rather than concentrate from the USA. We're writing to you now for three reasons. Firstly, we enclose an appointment to see you. It's important that we take a blood sample from you for the virus tests so that we can monitor over the page, please, virus exposure in all our patients who've received factor concentrates. We would also like to perform some skin tests which measure the body's defences against infections. At the same time, we'll be very happy to give further information and to answer any questions you may have about the virus and the tests. And then the second, there's a recommendation about precautions to take. I won't read those out. They're set out there. And thirdly, at the bottom of the page, it talks about the position of wife, family members and sexual partners. Um, and the top of the next page says we'll be happy to talk with them about such concerns. Please bring them along with if you if you would like us to do this. So c c can, can you assist, um, Professor, with uh, en enabling us to understand better the, the process um, uh, for, uh, 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 that was envisaged with this letter? Yeah, so I've now found my written statement 41, one, uh, where you asked me what role did you play in drafting the letter? Yes. Okay, so I was asked about this at the Penrose inquiry, and at the Penrose inquiry I didn't recognise the letter. I never had a copy of it, and my recollection at the Penrose inquiry um, was I'd just come back from a week's holiday and it was the busiest day of the year. I was working on another unit um, and the wards in January, the medical wards are absolutely crammed full of casualties of Hogmanay and it was a very busy time. So I really had only a very brief meeting by Dr. Forbes and the haemophilia sister and he showed the letter, um, which I think was, uh, uh, obviously hadn't signed it by then. Um, and at the Penrose inquiry, I had to read through it slowly and remember it, because I remember a further letter sent out in, in April, uh, and with the help of Mr. Gardner for the inquiry, uh, who showed me the form letter drafted by Dr. Forbes with other centre directors, He'd put that in as the advice bit, and then he had customised it for the Glasgow uh, uh, situation. Um, and that's so I took it home from the Penrose Inquiry, thought about it, and I recalled that Dr. Forbes drafted the letter, discussed it, and asked if I could have my signature. And I said, Why? Because I'm not a, not a consultant, I'm not working on the unit. And Dr. Forbes wanted another doctor. Uh, to sign it, that in the event that the patient wanted to discuss it, and Dr. Forrest was not available, I could be for contact. And I said, okay, that's fine. Um, and I presumed that the letter would then be sent out to patients with appointments by Sister um, Campbell. And then when I looked at it, I saw that he was wanting to take this draft and discuss it at the AIDS Working Party, which was addressing these kind of issues. Um, I've only recently received the minutes of that Working Party uh, on the 11th of January. Um, and it just says that Dr. Forbes uh, issued a package of information uh, which could have included this letter for the, uh, for the discussion. As far as you know, First of all, was this letter, or something very like it, sent out to the patients of the Haemophilia Centre? Uh, I don't know. Um, and let me see. I had no role in sending the letters, and I was asked what the purpose was, which I think we have discussed. Um, And then you ask me about what's the evidence for the risk of a disease being small, 
On what basis was it less than risk of bleeding? And asked about that. Why was the advice given? Why was it given in those terms? And it's consistent with the form letter. In your view, and given the terms in which it's expressed, is that advice consistent with the principles of patient consent that were in place at the time? Um, Professor, what I'm trying to understand yeah. is how and when patients in Glasgow Royal Infirmary were tested for HTLV3 and told of their results. Now, we've looked at the GALO process, and as far as we can see, and certainly it seems to be the effect of Professor Forbes' evidence at Penrose, that did not lead to patients being told the, the, the results of the GALO testing. You've referred to, and we'll pick it up in later minutes, a minute of a meeting that you attended later in 85, um, you, you referred, uh, and in your evidence, Professor Forbes and his, to there being then a, a further process of testing undertaken by Dr. Follett at Ruck Hill. Do you know whether patients, whether that testing was undertaken on, on stored samples or whether patients were asked to provide samples and had explained to them what was going to be done with the samples? So my recollection is that it took Dr. Follett until about April to set up a validated test that had been approved for um, HIV testing in a format that could be um, given to patients. In other words, a very low risk of false positives and false negatives. And I think from memory it was April, and I think um, listening to Professor Ludlam's evidence last year, it took till about that time for his colleagues in Edinburgh at the Regional Virus Laboratory there to set up a, a confirmatory test. So I think it took um, it took a while to, to do that. Um, I think that Dr. Forbes wanted um, initially to see the patients who were query positive on the basis of the Gallo test with Dr. Wilkie and counsel them privately about the um, situation, about AIDS testing, and about this um, results of the study and indicating that um, what they would want to do is to get their informed consent to uh, a validated test after counseling about AIDS, positive tests, negative tests, etc. And then for Dr. Follett to perform that, after which Dr. Forbes and Dr. Wilkie, and it's in their evidence, would inform the patients that they were positive or negative by these tests. And I would assume that he would want to concentrate on sending this letter first, as the Penrose Inquiry Council suggested, um, and that seems entirely reasonable. And I recall that Dr. Wilkie's evidence, which I think I quote at some point, was she was asked about the evolution of the events and um, said uh, something about the first 20 patients were sent letters. And Dr. Wilkie, I think, said, yes, that would be the positives or words to that effect. So I can see that the priority in Dr. Forbes's mind would probably to say as we, we should see these patients as soon as possible, explain the situation, and get their informed consent for a fresh sample to be sent in the proper way to Dr. Follett okay. and pre cancelled and then post cancelled according to the result. That's that is my understanding. But I should stress that during this time I wasn't working on the haemophilia unit, I was working on another unit. Dr. Forbes wanted very much to do this himself with Dr. Wilkie and Dr. Follett. I wasn't involved in any way. And I think it was only um, in about April to May that Dr. Forbes had a meeting with myself and the haemophilia sister and said, right, we've now seen the first um, 
uh, we've now seen this first group of patients and we have validated tests and the results. And at that time, Dr. Forbes said, right, you've just heard from the university that you're going to be promoted to a senior lecturer from October. Uh, and you'll then hopefully become a consultant or an honorary consultant. And I'd like you at this stage to get involved on the assumption that as and when you get to that stage, you can join me in returning to the Haemophilia Center and help me uh, in this uh, situation of um, talking to patients about AIDS and the, and the results, because he thought that should be done at consultant level. So he wanted me to involve in the planning of that process. And he was then, Dr. Forbes, setting up this uh, Glasgow AIDS group. And I think you have the minutes of its first meeting, um, maybe 31st of May, at which all these issues were discussed. And I don't know if you want to go on to that, but Dr. Follett um, had uh, confirmed that there were 12 patients seropositive by a validated uh, test. And we were, <clears throat> we had by that time uh, met with Dr. Kennedy from the Infectious Diseases Unit and were setting up arrangements for uh, general care of particularly seropositive patients. That is what I recall as the version of events. So uh, you, you've got a recollection of a meeting you had in, 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 in around April with Dr. Forbes as, along the lines you've discussed. D is this the position then? In terms of what happened between December and the publication of the article in The Lancet and April, um, uh, um, you've got no knowledge whatsoever of the process and what you've told us your understanding is, is based primarily on evidence given by others to the Penrose inquiry. Is that right? Yes, indeed. So, um, as I think I have said in my written statement, Oh, I think I think I've covered it. Dr. Forbes said he'd keep me informed, but he said this is my baby. I want to I want to handle it. Um, I did. Sorry, I did send out with Dr. Forbes a joint letter in April. We're just going to come to that. It's based on that. Do you want me to go I, to that now? We're or? just going to come to that. But, um, PRSC three zero three five six seven, please, Shamek. P Professor Lowe, can, can you just assist before we look at the detail of the April letter with this? It, it, it might be thought to be a little odd to be sending out in January such an important letter with the name on of a doctor who's been told nothing about the proposed process and is going to have no involvement in it. D do you have any observation to make on that? Um. Yes, looking back on it, it does seem very strange. And I think I pointed out that, you know, why me? And Dr. Forbes's answer is, well, you've just been around the most number of, of years. The uh, current haemophilia registrar has just been there for a year or so. Um, and uh, I think a lot of these patients will remember who you are. Um, and would be a contact at least to um, discuss with them if I'm not in the country. And I said, well, but you know, what what use would that uh, what use would that be? So it is it is surprising. Right, we'll look at the April letter then. Um, well, I mean, he, what he could have done, uh, had that been his his purpose, would be to say, well, if if I'm not available, contact uh, Dr. Lowe. But he didn't. Did you ever ask him why he didn't do that, rather than have your name put as a, as a signatory to a letter you had not drafted uh, and uh, had no direct involvement in whatsoever? Well, that's right. I mean, as I say, I, I, I only saw this letter very briefly for a brief discussion. I never had a copy of it. And I'm sorry, I think, did I say... Um, Sorry, it's just at the end of my written statement. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Um, So 4215, I'm surprised that my name appears first. I wonder if it was a mistake. Dr. Forbes um, was doing all the work. I never saw any copy of this letter in center files or case records, and I wonder if it was in fact sent to patients in a different and more appropriate format. I do not recall ever being contacted by any patient to discuss this letter. I do not recall any patient that I subsequently reviewed at the clinic mentioning it or producing it. And then 41.6, obviously I could not discuss this with Professor Forbes during the Penrose inquiry. After the final report was published in 2015, I visited him at home for social catch-up, discuss reports conclusions. Um, and I recall he told me that he thought he'd modified the draft letter after discussion at the UK working party meeting, <laughs> putting his name first or something like that. I. I, I don't know, but that's all I can really tell you. If, if we look at the April letter on screen, um, Professor, um, and we can see it's dated April 1985, if we go to the third page, we can see Dr Lowe's name, um, your name is still first, Dr Forbes is, 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 is second. It, does it follow from what you've just told us and what you say in your witness statement at paragraph 41.6 that it's possible the January 85 letter never went out at all and that the April 85 letter is the is is effectively the the redrafted version that may have been sent to patients um, yes I remember paying more attention to this letter because by that time as I say I think uh, we knew that I had been uh, informed of a promotion by the university, and I would be joining Dr. Forbes in due course uh, in this work. Because we can see that this letter, it replicates quite a lot of the information that we've seen in the January version. Um, uh, it refers to a booklet, AIDS in the Blood, published by the Haemophilia Society, which is being sent out to patients. Um, and then says this in the third paragraph, um, as you may know, we have a haemophilia clinic on Ward 2 on Monday and Friday afternoons. We try to see all our patients there at least once a year. We're always happy to see and advise you. We've already seen and advised many of our patients about AIDS. If we've not yet discussed AIDS with you, we should be happy to do so at your next clinic appointment this year or sooner if you wish. And then it invites the patient receiving it to, to um, um, contact uh, the sister if they want um, to see you before the next appointment. And then we've got similar advice on AIDS being set out in the following pages. If we go to the top of the next page, paragraph three at the very top of the page, it says we don't yet have a blood test. We hope to have this within a few months. We do now have a blood test which detects antibody. And again, it's similar text to the January one. Refers again to having recently tested stored blood samples and the 10% figure, uh, um, and then goes on to set out in the bottom half of the page the general precautions. It's, it's quite difficult to make sense of who this would be being sent to, Professor, if the January letter had been sent. Do you know who it was intended this April letter would go to? Um, my... Um, understanding is that by April, and it, sorry, it doesn't have a date on April, presumably that would be put on in due course. As I said, Dr. Forbes and Dr. Wilkie had seen and cancelled and taken samples from a test uh, to be sent for Dr. Follett. And I think the understanding at this time is that we should now be sending um, this letter to uh, other patients with, with haemophilia. Let, let's try and pick it up and see to what extent we can make sense of it by reference to the meeting you've referred to, at which Dr. Follett attends. Uh, it's PRSE 
301606, please show it. So we can see it's minutes of AIDS information and advisory group, 31st of May, 85, chaired by Dr. Forbes. Your present, as indeed is Dr. Follett. And we can see um, uh, in paragraph two, number two on that page, HTLV3 antibody testing, Dr. Follett reported that the regional reference laboratory uses the Abbott kit at present, confirmed by immunofluorescence testing. If IF testing does not confirm, the sample is sent to Dr. Tedder in London. Of Glasgow patients tested to date, haemophiliac patients treated with commercial factor eight concentrate have the largest number of positive tests, all seroconverted between 81 and 83. Uh, and just, just pausing there, Professor, um, the, the statement in the records that all seroconverted between 81 and 83, which I think as we'll see when we look at later material, doesn't turn out to be the, the ultimate position, would that suggest that Dr. Follett, as well as testing possibly on fresh samples, must also have been testing on stored samples to some extent? Um, it, could, it could be. Um, I think there was a letter sent to the Lancet in March 1985 in which Dr. Um, Maddock has been looking back at presumably previous stored samples to um, clarify the date of seer conversion, is that correct? Well, I'm just, um, rather than, than, right. than, than um, look and at what Dr. Maddock was writing, do you have any recollection no. yourself of, of the process that was being undertaken by Dr. Follett at this time? Uh, no, I, no, I don't, sorry. This was my first meeting directly with Dr. Follett as, as part of the group. Okay. If we go on to the third page, please. And we look at the last paragraph. It says, Dr. Lowe reported that 16% of West of Scotland haemophiliacs were HGLB3 antibody positive, the lowest incidence amongst reported haemophilia centers. None had clinical symptoms, although some lymphopenia had been observed. These patients are being closely followed. What, what was the close following or close monitoring that was being undertaken in relation to the patients who had tested positive? Um, what uh, Dr. Forbes had arranged with Dr. Kennedy from Infectious Diseases is that these patients uh, uh, should be seen at least every three months, uh, as I think was general advice at the time amongst HIV positive patients to monitor their condition um, and their T cell results and that kind of thing and that a flexible policy was developed, which I, which I spoke about. So I'm reporting, I mean, I've not seen any of these uh, patients at all. Um, I'm just confirming that Dr. Follett has been um, uh, testing, these, uh, testing these patients. And I'm reporting really on behalf of Dr. Forbes, who was uh, chairing the meeting, that he told me that None had some clinical symptoms, although some lymphopenia had been observed. These patients are being closely followed. And then we'd had discussions about should they require hospital treatment, what should the policies be about admission either to the Royal Infirmary if they needed treatment for bleeding, or uh, Ruckhill Hospital if they needed treat, uh, treatment for um, um, infectious complications of HIV positivity. So I was talking really mostly about the, the policy, but um, I had no direct contact with these patients. I was just reporting um, what I had heard from Dr. Forbes and Dr. Follett. Okay. Um, I want to look at one other document for you, for, with you from uh, earlier in 1985, uh, well, actually undated, possibly early 1985. PRSE 302785, please show me. Now this is what's, it's headed advice sheet for adult patients and families acquired immune deficiency AIDS. And if we look at the first paragraph, it looks as though it's been drafted with a view to being sent to Glasgow patients and Edinburgh patients, because it says, please don't hesitate to phone your centre director for a personal appointment. And it gives the, the numbers for, for Glasgow and Edinburgh. If we zoom uh, back. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah. If we zoom back out again, um, uh, 
if we go to the third page, please. I think there are three, I think there are. We can see um, on the third page at the very end, it says this, remember that you must continue to treat yourself with the concentrates as the risks are much greater of bleeding than of contracting the rare disease of AIDS. Now, Professor, we understand from evidence given by Professor Ludlam that this is a sheet that was intended to, from his perspective, be, uh, and, and was sent to uh, patients in Edinburgh. Um, the recommendation we see there set out at the end, you must continue to treat yourself, is not repeated in the January and April letters that we've looked at from Glasgow, which says you should continue, but not you must. Were you party to any discussions with Dr. Forbes, or indeed Dr. Ludlam, or anybody else about the terms in which an information sheet or information should be provided to, to patients, and in particular about what they should be told about continuing with treatment? Uh, no, uh, as I say, um, the two Glasgow letters were very much the work of, of Dr. Uh, Dr. Forbes. Uh, I was very happy to add my name to the April one for the reasons that I've been given and that um, the situation was now much clearer. I was hoping to become a consultant and was happy to help in due course and that it was giving uh, updated information, for example, that factor nine concentrates were now heat treated as well as factor eight, etc. And I, I felt that the Peter Jones booklet uh, was actually very good. I think it was well received in, in the UK. It was written in a, a very uh, helpful style and a very good book to send to people so that they could read it and have a think before coming to the uh, appointment. Uh, I thought that was I thought that was very good. Um, I had no discussions about what the um, strength of recommendations about um, uh, treatment should be. Um, I think Dr. Forbes's term should rather than must. Well, you can argue about the degree of strength, but I nothing to um, nothing nothing to do with with that. Okay, well, can, can we move then to the end of eighty five and look at a letter which um, was copied to you? It's SBTS four zeros. 395-091. We can see it's a letter dated the 4th of December 1985 addressed to Dr. Cash. If we go to the third page... We can see it's from Dr. Maddock, and we can see it's copied to you and to Dr. Le to, to, and to Dr. Forbes at the Haemophilia Unit, um, as well as being copied to Dr. Davidson also um, at, at the Royal Infirmary. If we go back to the first page, and I'm just going to see if you can help us understand what, what we might learn from this letter, Professor. Um, it's headed re HTLB3 LAV zero conversion since introduction of heat treated concentrate. We've had three zero conversions this year. Details are as follows. Patient one, who is a, a factor eight deficient, so a haemophilia A patient, we can see from the dates um, that the first positive date there is the 25th of October 1985, with a negative date from, the, from October of 1984. It would seem from this, Professor, please tell me if you think I'm wrong, that um, the process of testing is still ongoing in the autumn of 1985. Uh, yes, it, it is. If we go over the page then and look at patient two, and we, um, we can see there it's a patient with factor nine deficiency, and the test results there tell us 29th of January 85 negative, 8th of November 85 positive. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, again, testing being undertaken in, in this instance in November of, or 
sometime between November and, and early December 1985. And then if we look at patient three, on the third page, it's another factor eight deficient patient. It said zero converted in October slash November. There's reference to what the treatment has been received in 84 and 85, fibre only. Um, and then Dr. Maddox says this, obviously we cannot be entirely sure that heat-treated concentrate is implicated in patients one and four. Not quite sure what the reference to four is. But the weight of evidence in reviewing estimated dates of zero conversion strongly points to heat-treated material being the, course, the source. And then there's a discussion about literature for zero conversion intervals. Now this would tend to suggest that you're being told in December of 1985, or Dr. Cash is being told, and, and, and you, you no doubt are also being told, that you have in the autumn of 85 three zero conversions, two patients who, with haemophilia A, one with haemophilia B. Um, what, if anything, can you recall about what was going on at this stage um, and the reaction to learning, as it seems from this, that patients were zero converting on heat treated concentrates? Right, the date is the 4th of December, and that was probably my first day as a consultant, which is probably why Dr. Maddock is um, um, copying it to myself. I think it wasn't until early December that the, I was informed by the health board that we're, we're formalizing that you're now a, a consultant, so that seems appropriate. Um, let me, so I'm just trying to look at the data now. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, Dr. Maddock um, was asked by Dr. Forbes, to, um, just as he'd been doing in, in the kind of Melby Gallo paper, if he could liaise with Dr. Follett and um, work back uh, with all the information about the, the dates and collect data on the batches of different products, NHS or commercial. And that, of course, was routine practice uh, in informing SNBTS um, about any SEER conversions, which might or might not have been related to um, NHS concentrates. The, the easy one is patient three, and I agree there's a misprint uh, but it's presumably patients one and four, not patients one and three. Uh, patient three um, has only been with uh, fiber, which is a commercial activated factor nine concentrate for a patient with a high teeter um, inhibitor and porcine factor eight, which obviously wouldn't transmit HTLV being a human virus uh, for a dental extraction, and these are both acceptable alternatives for treating in inhibitor uh, patients. So I don't think that patient has got anything to do with SNBTS, but it's just good practice in keeping them informed in all the patients. But that would appear to be nothing to do with SNBTS um, uh, concentrates, and that uh, presumably must be um, ascribable that zero conversion to, to fiber, which is a commercial factor concentrate. Um, so working back with patient number two, this is a factor nine patient, um, treated only in 1983 and 1984, um, and no treatment in 1985. So this patient has always had, I presume, untreated um, SNBTS factor nine concentrate, which was the routine treatment for all patients with um, Christmas disease, unless they're very mild. Um, so this um, patient doesn't ever appear to have received heat treated concentrate because I think SNBTS only treated the factor nine concentrate um, in about August 1985. And meantime, um, Haemophilia Centre directors in Scotland decided to use commercial heat treated factor nine concentrate. And I think somewhere in the files you should have a, a letter I was shown at the Penrose inquiry from Dr. Davidson said just been to the reference directors meeting and the decision is making that will stop using 
SMBTS unheated factor IX concentrate and use heat treated or virally inactivated factor IX concentrate and that's what was used. So it seems as if this uh, factor IX deficient patient uh, only ever had unheat treated factor IX in 1984. Um, the, uh, it sounds as if this would be obviously retrospective testing of stored serum samples, presumably by Dr. Follett, um, because his first positive test was in November 85, and then it, I presume he attended the Haemophilia Clinic in January 85 and in August 84. Um, there wouldn't have been routine testing at the time because Dr. Follett didn't have the HIV tests set up in Glasgow. So these would be studies of uh, retrospective samples to try and estimate the date of seroconversion. Um, so the patient seroconverted sometime between January and November of 1985. Um, and the batches, it doesn't say when the batches were given, but it seemed most of his treatment was in 1983 and then a bit more in 1984. Um, now, if that was in late-ish 1984, uh, that could well have been the infected, um, the infected batch because Dr. Maddock goes on in his last page um, Oh, last page, uh, third paragraph. Obviously, we cannot be entirely sure that heat-treated concentrate is implicated in patients one and three. Um, let me think. And Dr. Maddock has reviewed the literature for seroconversion intervals. Um, and this is from the literature, I guess. Median duration, 84 days, uh, range 280 days. So it is perfectly possible that if patient two had factor IX concentrate late in 1984... Could, could you just pause uh, there for a moment, uh, please, Professor? Because uh, th those who are watching online may wish to follow uh, the document, uh, and y you've got it, but they haven't necessarily, uh, and they might want to see what is said about patient two. Could we go back, uh, please, Shumik? That, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting, but it's important that uh, those who are watching online have the chance to follow what you're saying. Okay, so what I was saying previously is Dr. Maddock has been reviewing the literature for seroconversion intervals. In other words, how long can it take between getting an infected batch of concentrate and getting a positive result? And then the page you're on now for patient two uh, we don't know when these batches were given in 1984, but say the last batch was the infected one, so it's in the later part of 1984, I don't know. Um, the next test done, um, well, I'm sorry, the next sample taken for retrospective testing is January, so that could have been a relatively short time from being exposed to an infected um, batch of concentrate and therefore it is negative because the patient has been infected but has not seroconverted that until later in 1985 sometime between January and November so that so I think um, what Dr. Maddox says is is true in the absence of any other source of infection the suspect batch would have been given sometime in 1984 out of those two batches and I think that, uh, yes, at the very end of Dr. Maddox's letter, if you go back to page three, <clears throat> five factor nine patients received either batch 695 or 714, which were the two batches this patient received in 1984, and we shall be determining their antibody status. In other words, to try and implicate a particular batch, as for example was extensively done in Professor Ludlam's patients in, in Edinburgh that I uh, detailed the studies. And finally, patient one. First page, please, Shomik. So,
So this is a factor VIII deficient severe haemophiliac with no inhibitor. First positive test, 2510, and date of last negative, 51084. And during 1984, had uh, a lot of uh, treatment. Um, and again, we don't know the dates in 1984. Um, but say again, as in patient two, if that uh, uh, if that last batch of 1984 concentrate had been given late in 1984, and then a year goes by before he has um, um, the first positive HDLB test uh, in October, at any time between well, any time between any date in 1984 and um, 1085, he could have seer converted, which is well within the um, um, literature for seer conversion intervals, which Dr. Maddock uh, states on page uh, three. Uh, median duration 84 days, range 21 to 280 days. So, um, you know, it's it's perfectly possible that these are uh, all patients who only received unheat treated SNBTS concentrates um, and never received heat treated concentrates. Um, so I, I note the time. I may have a couple more questions arising out of this document, but I can do that after the break. Uh, yes. Um, are we? We're continuing to de talk about uh, testing, are we, after the break? For a little while longer, not much more. Right, thank you very much. Well, we'll take a, a break uh, now until uh, five past four. Would that be, would that give you long enough, Professor? Uh, that would be fine. Five past four. <laughs>